to humane architecture, how cities are laboratories for societal progress, and Pama Kundu, independent architect. On November the 9th, 1989, I had just graduated in architecture, settled in my own apartment in Bombay, and the fall of the Berlin Wall reminded me that seemingly unshakable constructs can be impermanent, confirming the belief that nothing is impossible with imagination, determination, and persistence. Good afternoon. Um, I would share with you my 33-year-old journey as an architect and a professor of architecture in breaking the wall to humane architecture. I would like to stress on my aspiration that cities are laboratories for societal progress and to look at the current state of affairs where our norms and regulations have, are in some way innovation hindering. I would like us to step back a little bit and just look, just in only 100 odd years ago, we went worldwide from a culture of building with local expertise, building our homes, our habitat, with whatever we have in abundance around us. And in order to use local materials, we evolved our human skills to be able to use whatever material, from earth to stone to ice. We built with whatever we have just literally around us. And what we make makes us. And that's how human, humans and their skills evolved. And how did we get from such a landscape to another one where all over the world, we, in the course of industrialization, we have um, started advocating ideas of over-standardization, of the idea that one size fits all, regardless of geographical, climatic, cultural context, and all the contexts. And of course, this way of building has led to uh, most of our social, ec ecological, and economical problems. And everybody, even the rich countries, are talking about affordability of housing. So I want to also add the aspect that develop uh, developing countries uh, are being somehow influenced by the developed countries who are stressing a lot on the word efficiency. They are excessively, in my opinion, measuring excessively what is easier to measure and altogether leaving out some other aspects that are harder to measure, such as well-being, health, and aesthetics, and all those um, expectations that humans have from their homes. Suddenly, many of those very important criteria, which are harder to measure, are being left out in the chase for the, those numbers. So the wall that I am trying to break down is the notion that the human engagement in production of their own architecture, the homes and cities, human engagement has to make way for major outsourcing of construction, where every material and every skill comes from far away, just like our food culture also right now. And this has enormous consequences. So it's very, very difficult to take away the illusion of this wall that humans and human engagement is not possible to include because time is money, human costs more. But I would like to ask, what is the cost of saving all that time? Do we have more time? Do we have more time? Do we have less stress? Are our cities more beautiful? What was the advantage? So I asked myself, coming from India to, and uh, living in the European context, 
What is the point of doing efficiently things that need not be done at all? <laughs> and that's where I start my journey. To discover, first of all, to address the urban materiality problem and the whole environmental crisis, that it is a man-made crisis. And it's not the same like a tsunami or something that we should feel like victims of because we made it and we have to unmake it. So I think the main thing to address is to rethink our material culture. And to address this material culture, we have to realize that it's not just the problem of the material. We don't need to have a rhetoric of the mud versus concrete. This is the way we are handling it, uh, especially in the green rating systems that are coming out of the West. It's all about externalizing the problem to the material as if they were good or bad themselves. Actually, all materials come from the ground. Whether you are uh, in an area that there is stone or there's trees or there's earth, we, it's, the problem is not about the material. They are not guilty. The problem of urban materiality is in the way human resources are interacting with natural resources. So the problem has to be, the materiality problem is a problem of human habit that is acquired over industrialization. And um, I chose to address the solution by focusing on human empowerment in the midst of all the skepticism that human hands should not be allowed in the equation anymore. I have tried to promote a culture where uh, human ingenuity can be allowed to flourish, to have a culture where you are allowed to think with the hands, starting from the schools in which we teach and raise students, because most of the things that humans have discovered, we have stumbled upon them by engaging. And this must be allowed to occur. Then also I feel uh, human resourcefulness is also a matter to be celebrated because uh, the human is able to synthesize all the concerns. There is human, uh, we have emotional quotient, we have things which machines don't have, and we are basically useful. When there is a crisis, we work more, we pay attention, we give uh, attention to detail, we care about things, we care about how things look, how they feel, and so on. Also, I feel that we humans, uh, just like every other animal or organism that needs shelter, whether they are um, birds and bees, insects, all of them are building their own home. They have not to take major courses and get degrees and have all kinds of insurances to be able to allow to themselves to just build a home and get on with their life. We have created a situation because of this outsourcing of the way we build our houses, we have reached uh, numbers and uh, that uh, the cost of the house is such that by the time we die, we might have paid all the bills. So we are not having a home to, in order to live. We are living and spending our entire life so that one day our home is paid off. A home that we even don't like <laughs> and is often ugly and an eyesore, and when you look out of the, of the window, you also see others unhappy, and also you don't know which one is your house <laughs> in that skyscraper. So, so we are spending all of this money in order to save time, which we don't have. <laughs> so I think it is much better to address upfront the problem of urban materiality in which we enable and fuel collective imagination, the decentralized capacity of every human to be intelligent holistically and to allow this intelligence to actually enact and not treat work as a burden, as a job we don't like. All this came out of industrialization when the work life was separated so much that you are waiting from the day you took your job to retire or to go on a holiday. So when work will become a way to express yourself and people won't hate their jobs, uh, very different things will come into circulation. And we will 
at least not have habitat that is worse than the one we are producing. I just share a few of my own experiments coming from Bombay. I want to tell you, don't think all this is uh, possible only because I come from India. Everybody asks me this kind of uh, questions later because they are not able to imagine those strategies applied in developed countries. So in this international forum, I would like to, you to know that I come from Bombay, which has a bigger, higher density just like Dubai and all these places, we have got skyscrapers, you know. So it's not like it was easy to create all this kind of architecture coming from that same education. The result of those strategies I mentioned earlier is the, some of these projects where I tried to use not only the material you have around you in abundance, but the skills that you found in abundance. And nobody is buying those pots, etc., today. But as a person who is not nostalgic about the artisan skills uh, to, ha to continue to keep the pot in circulation, it's the skill that I am interested in. So I managed to create um, architecture out of uh, some of these. And a lot of this architecture has to do with using the same materials like tiles that used to be supported on um, wooden substructures. We are using engineering to have many more cubic meters of volume of architecture built by ingenious uh, methods of engineering where you have insulation now, you use the form that doesn't need any substructure and cre create an architecture which is contemporary but doesn't look alienating because the, there is an engagement of the people and engagement is not just labor, it is the engineering, the mind, and the everything, the imagination to do things differently. And to do things with much less materials, more efficient than our grandparents, not less. And also, this type of uh, each experiment done in this direction allowed me to build more and more interesting things where people of the place could contribute, for example, in this case, reinforced cement concrete slabs can be, uh, you know, the steel that goes into it is reduced by one third to one third because of the form. So these are lost form work in order to have efficient concrete. So you are saving two bars of steel out of every three that you see would have otherwise used. And at the same time, uh, these kind of methods allow us to produce modern materials which have high embodied energy by optimizing them. So through these kind of um, many pro projects that I've done over the last 33 years, I think uh, it is possible to create, not only is it possible, it is absolutely a must to see to it that every project that we have creates, builds knowledge and builds community while building buildings because we have to hurry up. And these are projects like co-housing, and things like that where we have to experiment, uh, be allowed to experiment even um, uh, in the city, you know, and not have only regulations which never allow you to try anything different because the way we are doing things is what created the problem. So it, in, uh, I have managed to be part of projects where we, we have done things very radically such as building mud houses and baking them in situ so that the energy that goes into a brick kiln when you fire bricks, uh, you lose around 40% of the energy into the kiln balls each time you fire. Here, that kind of a, uh, the energy to fire brick, bricks uh, that you will fire inside a house which is first a kiln and then it, the, the space becomes a house. You know, we have been doing very radical things because even if a technology has only 10% chance of succeeding, we have to welcome it. We, what we know is already a failure is the current, a lot of the current ways of doing things. So not put all the burden of the risk on those who are trying new things. This is the Homes for Homeless Children where I have uh, applied this um, technique. I have also, uh, I want to touch upon 
there won't be time to mention it, just so that you don't have uh, many of these images look like vernacular architecture, so people don't see the <coughs> design innovation behind it. So here, um, I just want to show that also in cement and steel, there's a lot you can do to minimize them to two and a half centimeters and to uh, use chicken mesh and floor finishes that you don't need to put other tiles upon them, etc. With very, very little chicken mesh instead of thick diameter steel, I've also been pro creating prefab housing um, and sanitation units, which you can assemble in a day. And also for larger um, public buildings to create a... a <laughs> Hi. I should stop here or finish my sentence. Okay, so sorry, I've, I've run out of time. I'm trying to also use all this Amazon and urban waste that we generate as form work to be able to quickly produce houses with very little materials and uh, provide shelter. I'm showing you some urban waste examples very quickly. I can also stop here. Okay, thank you. Thank you.